Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You just have to remember that God has a personalized, individualized, perfect plan for each one of us. And we might as well just quit looking at other people trying to figure out why we don't have what they have. Out of control and loving it. And I'm not talking about you being out of control and doing whatever you want to do. I'm talking about stop trying to control other people and circumstances and even sometimes God and learn how to let go of that stress and you'll love it. There's two ways we can look at this. First of all, you don't want to let anybody control you. That's not God's will for your life. It's not good for them and it's not good for you. And you don't want to be trying to control other people. The desire to control is rooted in selfishness. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Say that with me. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not ir irritable and it is not resentful. Proverbs 13, 10 says that only by pride comes strife. You, you can't have strife unless there's a pride problem. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Wow. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Isaiah 2, 11 and 12. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Good, three people like that. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he might in, in, um, exalt you. I start to say insult you. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly and truly, if you've been around long enough, you know God will give you an opportunity to humble yourself. But if you don't, he will do it for you, usually publicly. And it can be pretty painful. So I highly recommend doing it yourself while you can do it in private. You're right, God. I'm wrong. Amen. Now, it's also pride that causes us to feel that we must always give our opinion about things that are actually none of our business. <laughs> do you know there's three scriptures just as plain as they can be that tell us to mind our own business. So, how many of you kind of like to get into other people's business? Come on, I don't want one of these <laughs> down here things. <laughs> how many of you like, you know. Dave and I used to live, live next door to a single man that owned a, a big house. And we just couldn't figure out why this single guy wanted a house with four bedrooms in it. It's like, you know, what a waste of money. Now, keep in mind, we didn't even know this guy's first name. <laughs> but one day we're driving out, and so Dave, Dave or I said, well, maybe he did it for an investment. And then the other one said, well, but he could have found a lot better investments than that because he's got to take care of this big place. And so we spent maybe 10 minutes planning this guy's financial future, <laughs> and we didn't even know his name. 
Can I tell you that in Romans 14, the Bible says that every man will give an account of himself. God's not gonna ask you about anybody else, not gonna ask you about your husband, not gonna ask you about your kids, your friends. He's gonna ask you about you. And another way we can keep a lot of stress out of our life, now come on, another way we can keep a lot of stress out of our life is just by staying out of other people's business. You don't even need to have an opinion where you don't have any responsibility. Not even an opinion. Well, I think, well, I think, well, nobody cares what you think <laughs> and nobody wants to know what you think. The only time we really should give an opinion is if it's asked for, and then we need to do it carefully. 2 Thessalonians 3.11, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but being busy bodies. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your own hands. And 1 Peter 4.15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. You know what I think is interesting about that? A meddler is in a list with murderer, thief, and evildoer. I just noticed it today. I thought, wow, those are heavy hitters. <laughs> you know, most of us wouldn't think that being a little nosy was a problem. <laughs> but, I mean, it's right up there with a bunch of serious stuff. Sometimes I have to say to myself, Joyce, it's none of your business, it's none of your business, it's none of your business. Come on. Anybody besides me ever have a problem with this? <laughs> now, this doesn't mean we never correct a person who's in sin or try to help them in any way, but there's a difference in genuinely trying to help somebody and trying to get into their business when you don't need to. Great example in John 21, beginning in verse 18. This is Jesus talking to Peter. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted to go, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. So he's given Peter the, the heads up that things are gonna be a little more difficult for him in life now than they have been. And I don't think that he was talking about young in years. I think he was talking about when you were younger in the Lord. And you know, when you're younger in the Lord, to be honest, you do pretty much just do what you want to do and pray for God to bless it. And, and a lot of times he does for a period of time because he's establishing a father-child loving relationship with you. But just like when our own children grow up, we don't want to have to keep taking care of them all the time, we want a transition to come at some point where they say, Mom, Dad, what can I do for you? And so Jesus is saying, when you were young, you pretty much did what you wanted to, but things are going to change now, and I'm going to lead you into some things that may not be the most fun for you, but it's what I need. And in verse 19, it says, this he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. You know, Peter was crucified upside down on a cross. And then after saying that, he just said to him, follow me. Now, Peter just needed at that point to say, yes, Lord. But Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That happened to be John. John wrote the book of John, and he referred to himself over and over as I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I know Peter's personality well enough to know that that just got all over him. <laughs> like, yeah, you're the disciple whom Jesus loves. I mean, you know, these were people just like we are. I mean, it's even a little bit aggravating to me to hear John say that. So I can imagine how Peter felt about it. And I mean, these guys had problems just like we would have problems if we were in a group. They were jealous of each other. They competed with each other. 
And I think that knowing Peter's personality, that he probably just had a hard time with all the ooey gooey, you know, John laid on Jesus' breast at <laughs> dinner and they just had this great loving relationship. And you know, Peter always wanted to run the show. So he's gotten the bad news that things are gonna be a little hard for him toward the end. He sees John and he, sa and he says, um, when Peter saw him, he said, Jesus, what about this man? What's, what's going to happen to him? Well, you know, we're not really good at it if we're having a hard time and everybody else is having a good old time. Eh? At least if we're going to be miserable, we'd like some of our friends to be miserable with us. And Jesus said, verse 22, if it's my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So Jesus just told Peter, mind your own business. Now think about it for a minute. We're having a problem. We've been having a problem for a long time. Maybe you're a single girl and you haven't had a date in 12 years. <laughs> and your friend who's not nearly as attractive as you are in your opinion. <laughs> She just can't beat the guys off with a stick. They're just after her all the time. And so, <laughs> you don't like it. And you love her with the love of the Lord, but you don't really like her. <laughs> How many of you know about that? I love you with the love of the Lord. I can't stand you, but I love you with the love of the Lord. See? And all you have to do, you don't have to try to figure out why you haven't had a date and she has. You have to tell God how unfair it is. You just have to remember that God has a personalized, individualized, perfect plan for each one of us. And we might as well just quit looking at other people trying to figure out why we don't have what they have. Pastors can get into the same thing. Get jealous of another pastor because he's got a bigger church. and You've got this and you've got that. And yeah, 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 you know. You know, anybody that's successful is always going to have a certain amount of people that aren't going to like him. And you know why? Jealousy. Just plain jealousy. So I'm just going to say it the sweetest, kindest, nicest way that I know how to. Mind your own business. <laughs> Third reason we may try to control people is because we're afraid of being taken advantage of. After being sexually abused by my father, who was did it all through control, manipulation and control. He didn't force me physically, but he forced me with fear. And my father controlled everything that went on in our house. What he wanted to watch on television is what you watched. You ate what he wanted to eat. You got up when he got up. You went to bed when he went to bed. And somewhere along the line, in the middle of all that, I started making promises to myself when I get out of here, nobody is going to ever tell me what to do again. So when you make those kind of vows to yourself, inner vows, then I married the first guy that came along, and he was basically a con man and a thief. And so he was always lying and manipulative. And so by the time I went through my dad and my first husband, and then wonderful Dave came along, I took it all out on him. And so when Dave would try to give me a little bit of advice, or like Dave is very protective of me. And so he's always trying to tell me things to keep me from getting hurt. Like how to get out of the bathtub. And, you know, <laughs> just stuff that I am like. See, I would take it like, 
Why do you always have to try to tell me what to do? But he really, he was trying to love me. But because I had this stuff inside me from the past, I couldn't take it that way. I always took it like he was trying to control me. And that really wasn't what he was trying to do at all. And I'm, I'm sharing this because I believe many of you have been hurt in the past. And you may be doing the same thing that I was doing. You may be now a couple of husbands down the road. <laughs> and you can't keep blaming the new guy for everything that the old guys did. Come on. Because it's just not fair. It's just not fair to do that. And so I had to actually come to a point where I repented for those inner vows that I made. Nobody's ever going to control me again. Nobody's ever going to control me again. And I had to come full circle back to realizing that God establishes order everywhere you go. And everywhere you go, you need to know who's in, con who's in charge, who has the authority, and you need to be willing to come under that authority. And I'm up here preaching tonight, but this is Joel's house. And so he's sitting down there, but he's really the one in control. Because if he told me not to do something, then I better not do it. And we need to be willing to come under authority. Now listen to me. We have so much rebellion in the world today. It is unbelievable how rebellious people are. And the Bible says that rebellion is the spirit of antichrist. And we need to be very careful about this attitude that's creeping up on everybody that nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I please. When God establishes order, it's not so one person can control another, but it's so you can have peace. Everybody obviously can't be in charge. <laughs> Somebody has to always be the person that calls the final shots and everything, that person also is the one with the responsibility. Now, probably none of you have any problem coming under authority, do you? <laughs> you know what? You have no business ever being in authority if you don't know how to come under authority. I worked for a, a man for a long time that was not very easy to work with, and he wasn't very fair in a lot of ways. And God used that situation to teach me how to be submissive with a decent attitude, even with somebody that I really didn't agree with. But I learned so much out of that experience. You know, sometimes... Everything you learn is not pleasant. Like from being mistreated, I learned not to mistreat people because I knew how it felt from having it done to me. If you have a leadership personality, see yourself as a leader, not a boss. Because if you say I'm the boss, then you're going to be bossy. But if you see yourself as a leader, then you'll know that means that you have to set a good example for people, not just be telling them what they need to be, but leading them by example into what they need to be. So we may try to control because we're afraid of being taken advantage of. Or the fourth thing is, we may try to control people just because we've got a strong temperament. And our temperament, the temperament that God gives us does play into things. I was listening to a, a, I've been listening to a man named Martin Lloyd-Jones, who they say was probably the best Bible teacher of this century, and he's just really a very good Bible teacher. And he, interestingly enough, from that era, you wouldn't think that you'd hear people talk about this, but he talks a lot about how our temperament plays into the way that we handle things. And he said, like, some people are just never going to be as cheery as some other people. You know, some people, are they just have a, a, a deeper, more melancholy personality, and they would be more inclined toward getting depressed. You know, where other people, they just, like, can bubble through life every single day, and 
everything's a big joke to them. You know, Dave gets up in the morning and he gets up singing and I just don't even want to talk or talk to or see a human until <laughs> I have my coffee. Amen? It's like the only person that I can stand to talk to that time of the morning is Jesus. <laughs> but if you give me about an hour, I'll be okay. So if you, if you have a strong personality, you have, to, you have to be careful that you're balanced with it, that you're not trying to tell everybody in the world what to do. Know when you're in control and when you need to come under control. Amen? Now, there is only one thing in your life that God has told you to control, and that is yourself. <laughs> So instead of trying to control everybody else, we need to use more self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So don't ever say again, I just don't have any self-control. You may not be using it, <laughs> but you have it. And the more you use it, the easier it will be to use it. Paul said, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. And they do. A good athlete, I mean, they observe a bedtime, they exercise, they eat certain ways, they, you know. And he says, they do it to win a wreath that is perishable. So you think about what some of these sports people do are like a bodybuilder, what they go through trying to train just to stand on a stage and show off their muscles and are like to get a wreath of flowers or a ribbon or a trophy. They do all that just for that. But he says, we're doing it for a reward that is imperishable. So if they're willing to discipline themselves to that degree just to win something that's already in the process of rotting when they take it home, how much more should we be willing to control ourselves in order to have what God has promised us, which is eternal life with him? So two scriptures, both in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable so I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Well, the Amplified Bible says, but I buffet my body. However, I think we misread that for a long time and we thought it said, I buffet my body. <laughs> right here. Paul says, I buffet my body. <laughs> Same spelling, different pronunciation. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. I won't let sugar control me. I won't let drugs control me. I won't let alcohol control me. I'm not going to let people control me. Come on now. I'm not going to let an eating disorder control me. We don't realize sometimes how powerful we are with God on our side. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength that I need. Well, everybody wants to be free from controlling people and circumstances. But true freedom comes internally when we surrender to the work of Jesus Christ and His transforming power in us. He can change us from the inside out.
This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future, change her situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give and we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl, or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference. Vragen? Bel ons op. Wij zijn er voor je. Telefoonnummer 026 20 22 100.